So we're very, very pleased, Gunnar, that you're bringing Leotrep to be you, that you're bringing the memory of Leotrep to us today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a little weird to do it this way because I so like to see faces and then I always take one face and talk to that face. So now I will take you, Michael. <laughs> You're my face for tonight. Okay. And, but I will read from the screen anyway, so I will see my letters. And thank you for inviting me. It's a real honor. And um, I, yeah, I, I was looking forward to it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about identity, Jewish identity, since at least here in Germany, where I'm now engaged a little bit, and uh, we are dealing a lot with this question, what is Jewish identity right now? What can it be in 2020? Um, why is it so hard for Jews to some, somehow forge an identity while it's seems to be easier for other minorities and why is it so hard for the major, majority to accept that Jews might also have an identity that's different from theirs. So um, we have been questioned, the Jewish community in Germany has been questioned a lot in the last couple of years on um, all kinds of things. Um, circumcision, kashrut, little remarks that hurt, that stick, that sting, anti-Semitism, when Jews say, well, but it does not only come from right-wing people, it also comes from the left, and it does actually also come from the Muslim community. Uh, they are not believed. They, uh, they are what they are saying, their experiences are diminished. So it's, a, it's just a kind of struggle here. And I thought, wait a minute, when I do this reading, that was exactly what Leo had been dealing with already in the uh, 30s when the Nazis came to power, Jewish identity. And um, how is it possible for Jews to to live a life as, as Jews, in my husband's case, as a devoted religious Jew. Also, he liberated himself, kind of, if you want to put it that way. So, um, but he still put on his tefillin. He kept, we kept kosher at home, at least we separated milchig and fleischig and so on and so on. So, um, so he was always, he had been dealing with this question, through his throughout his life and for him and his father his father was a neo-orthodox Jew um, that as many of you might know was founded by Samson Raphael Hirsch and since I will mention Hirsch in my reading I will just explain to you in one sentence or in two sentences who he was he was a rabbi um, who said an orthodox rabbi um, who said we can't we can't just enclose ourselves anymore. We have to open up. And he took the word of the prophet Jeremiah and changed it a little bit, played around a little bit with it. And as Jeremiah had said, we the, you came as captives to Babylonia, and and but you have to behave. You have to be citizens. You have to pray for the well-being and the peace of the country because in its peace will lie your peace. So Samson Raphael Hirsch took that and put that on Germany and said, you can be, you have to be, of course, religious Jews. You have to keep, uh, keep uh, the, the, um, the mitzvot. And, but you still, you have to open up to society. And that was uh, where, how my husband had grown up. He was a he was really dedicated to Judaism, but he also was dedicated to German culture. He loved opera. Uh, he loved arts. He, um, when he started to learn Torah and Talmud at age six, he also, that was also the first time his father took him to the opera. So um, that was Samson Raphael Hirsch. And then I'm also, um, I'm reading about another man. His name is Franz Reiersbach. Franz Reiersbach was a Jew in the congregation of my husband 
who was the Landesrabbiner, the rabbi of the state of Oldenburg. He had 15 congregations there. And Franz Reisbach was a congregant of his. Um, he was also a social democrat and the Gestapo had um, arrested him a couple of times already. And then by the end of September, 1936, they had really gotten him. Right. And, um, and um, then um, he was finally uh, taken by the Gestapo. And um, when he didn't shut up, he was brought to the uh, concentration camp. And uh, three weeks, 20 days later, the, uh, the family was informed that they could get their, his ashes if they would play 20 marks. So, mm -hmm. and Leo writes about him. And he says actually about him, and I want to read it to you, just that you have a picture of who this man was. My husband writes about him. He was a man with the highest intellect, liberal and self-confident, an atheist, but a proud fighter for civil rights, who could never stay silent when he saw injustice. But he was, yeah, he had left the congregation a long, long time ago already, but still um, Leo Trapp was visiting him at prison quite a few times. When I quote, which I will do a couple of times, I will read from the biography, which um, was published, has been published here in 2018. And that I wrote, but I also used excerpts of, um, of my husband's books. He had also started already his biography and I use excerpts of that in, in the biography I wrote. And, um, and when I quote, it's either from that or it's from a book that he wrote about the uh, Jewish community in Oldenburg. Okay, and this, um, we, we start with the, with the part of the biography where the Nazis are in power. He is in Oldenburg, he is rabbi in Oldenburg. They are in a very, very bad um, state because, um, because Oldenburg is a, um, is a, a state um, in Germany where the Nazis came already to power, had come to power already before the Nazis were elected in Berlin. So they were so right wing. It was a mainly agricultural um, area and they were so right wing that they had elected the Nazi party already when there were no Nazis in, in charge in, in, in Berlin. So that is how bad it was. And this is um, how um, a part of it, how he dealt with it, or with it. His congregation needed a counterweight to the terror. Trapp began organizing cultural events. He invited singers, orchestras, and other artists via the Jewish Cultural Association, the Jüdische Kulturbund, which had meanwhile built up a network throughout the Reich in which as many unemployed Jewish artists as possible were provided with work. The rabbi organized movie nights, lectures, and readings. In his rabbinical work, he concentrated on, quote, strengthening the essence and knowledge of Judaism. Adult courses were held regularly to study the Bible, the Talmud, and Jewish history, literature, and law. The purpose of the talks was to combine teaching with encouragement." End of quote. What was the relevance of learning Torah in this period of history to hear God's word? How crucial was religious encouragement? It was decisive, according to Trepp. His congregation should not only learn for the sake of learning and knowledge, the knowledge and awareness of their Jewish teachings and culture should help them to maintain and strengthen their self-respect and self-love. Franz Reiersbach's death was hard for Trapp to accept because Reiersbach had rejected and pushed aside something that, from the rabbi's point of view, could have given him strength in a miserable situation. He summed up his thoughts about the murdered man with the words, if he hadn't been a Jew, 
He might have survived despite his actions. The tragedy of what happened was that he died a Jew without having drawn strength and pride for martyrdom from the sources of Jewishness and Jewish teaching. You could call it presumptuous or something you would accept from a rabbi. And yet, his words about Francois Yersbach reveal his sadness, if not grief. Now, in the years of persecution and threat, Trapp came to the realization that Hirsch vision was only a dream, that it did not win any sympathy or even affection for neo-Orthodox Jews like him and his father lived as an Israel mensch, how Hirsch had called it, Jews who identified with their religion and lived by its ethical code, approaching others as such and standing up for the well-being and the prosperity of the country as a whole. But Trapp also realized that the exclusive focus of many Jews on their homeland, their commitment to being German, had had just as little effect on the non-Jewish side. These Jews now had nothing. According to the regime and their fellow citizens, they were no longer to be considered as Germans, while they had voluntarily rejected their identity as Jews. He genuinely, genuinely felt for these people. His words about Reiersbach express what Gershom Scholem called Ahavat Yisrael, the love for the Jewish people. Scholem wrote about, wrote about it in a letter to Hannah Arendt in the 60s, accusing her of carrying no trace of this love within her, like so many intellectuals from Germany. For Arendt, Prioritizing a loyalty to Jews sim symbolized a focus on the national, on a religious attachment that excluded a connection to the common struggle for good. For Scholem, though, especially after the Shoah, it was a question of solidarity. Leo Trapp lived this solidarity with the Jewish people and had a deep understanding of Jewish teaching and of the history of his people on which was based his love for the Jewish community and for the Jews. But although he regretted those departures, in the end, he tried to understand and explain them. Now it's quote again, and I leave a part out. It's just to, um, yeah, to hear him in his own voice. External pressure from society can lead to internal cohesion within an oppressed group. Very often, however, the opposite happens, especially when there is a way out for the oppressed. The discriminated group then accepts the judgment of the outside world and sees itself according to the value judgments of its opponents. The problem raised by Trepp was old and well known to him, although it always intensified as anti-Semitism grew. Since Moses Mendelssohn, Jews had begun to see themselves and their culture through the eyes of others. For many Jewish thinkers who followed Mendelssohn, this was a dangerous and untenable position. Hirsch attacks this attitude vehemently, vehemently. As we will see in his later life, Trapp saw the hurdles to a better positive understanding of their religion, not only within the Jewish community, the laity, among whom many seek an ethics and philosophy of life, a basis for a fulfilled life, fulfilled life, and then find it in Buddhism or in the world of the intellect. No, he says, the failure, the incapacity lies also with us, with the rabbis, the scholars, who do not understand how to teach Jews the beauty and profundity of their own religion, their own ethics, their own values. And all that pained him to see Jews turning away from Judaism or having long since turned away from it. About 10 years later, in one of his first essays in the United States, he would promote understanding for the German Jews, who were sometimes almost despised by the American Jews, looked down upon because they were more German than Jewish and because they insisted on their Germanness even during the Nazi regime. In short, because they were bad Jews. With affection and empathy, Trapp tried to explain 
why things had developed this specific way in Germany. Unlike in the East, Jews had lived side by side with Christians and yet had still been surrounded constantly by anti-Semitism on every level, in every aspect of life. They had been insecure about themselves and yet, educated in the spirit of Lessing's liberalism, had always held the hope of becoming completely equal in the end. This is a quote now again, completely equal in the end. And in the meantime, they did not want to give their detractors a single ground to use in their arguments against them. Perceptively, Trapp describes the continuing love of the Jews, even in the early years of the National Socialist government for a country that perhaps never quite existed in reality. They painted for themselves an idealized image of a liberal Germany with which they identified, he writes, whatever did not fit into this romantic picture was declared un-German or not truly German. But although the German Jews had fully integrated and the two cultures, the Jewish and the German, complemented and enriched each other for them, the majority had not been assimilated, but had preserved their own identity." Quote, end of quote. To judge the to totality of German Jews according to the behavior of the assimilated ones who were highly visible but not representative did not do justice to the community, he wrote. And yet, at the beginning of the 30s, it was only a few individuals who really withdrew into their Jewishness and sought to gain strength from it. One of the few who quickly took this path and called for a commitment to Judaism, its greatness and values, was Robert Welch, editor-in-chief of the Jüdische Rundschau, a newspaper in Berlin, who, as a reaction to the boycott in April 1933, wrote a famous editorial in which he called upon the Jews, at that time figuratively, not literally, wear it with pride, the yellow mark. But in the meantime, this had become the attitude of many Jews. Some of those who had assimilated would later say that it was the National Socialists who had turned them into Jews, Others now emphasized only one side of their identity. At any rate, the synagogues were full, the events organized by the Kulturbund were popular. Even at a time when they could still have gone to any cultural institution, many Jews preferred plays or lectures that dealt specifically with Jewish themes and which, according to the new laws, should not be attended by Aryans. And the Reichsvertretung, the national repre representative agency for the Jews, was also committed to emphasizing the Jewish aspect to the, of the German Jewish identity. Although, as Leo Beck said in 1933, the Jews still hoped, quote, that we will be able to forge a new genuine relationship with the new masters of Germany. For the young Rabbi Leo Trapp, there's only one way for the Jews to pre preserve their inner freedom and dignity. They must proudly confess their Judaism. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, the prayer in the evening and in the morning must become much more than their commitment to their God. It should make them aware every time they say it that they have given monotheism to humanity religious ethics on which everything is founded, a morality that others may now reject, but on the foundation of which they have nevertheless built their own culture of Christianity. They should be aware that when Jesus the Jew called for charity, his people had been following this commandment for thousands of years. His congregation should internalize that when the Nazis roared, do not buy from Jews, when they were cast out and humiliated as Sau Juden, Jewish pigs, no one could touch the promise that God gave them at Mount Sinai, that this God, their God, not only freed them from slavery in Egypt, but through structure and commandments and the commitment to one God gave them a framework 
that, that conveyed not only outer, but above all inner freedom that no one could take away from them. So far. Thank you, Gunda. Um, that was that was very very um, moving, and um, it's actually I have to say that just listening to your voice, read these things is uh, it's very comforting. Although the subject of what you're reading for us is so is so difficult to, is very difficult. It's very painful in so many ways. Yeah. Uh, I wonder. I wonder what people. How, how people respond to this, if people have comments or questions um, about this. And I'm particularly interested to, to, to know how this resonates today. Um, the idea that you could be firmly ensconced in your national context as a, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, devout Jew, as, as an observant Jew, and at the same time as a member of your, of your nation state of, say, the American society, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time feel that there might be some element of brittleness to this uh, construction. I, I wonder after, especially after Pittsburgh, whether people have felt that uh, something there is unsettled in their conviction of, of their of their of their of their integration that Americans tend to take for granted. Yeah. Well is this completely incomparable? Is this is really something that's unique to, to the German situation? You, as you mentioned, uh, Eastern European Jews would, would never felt quite as much well that's also maybe an exaggeration. I mean there were many people who were very Russified or polonized, and felt they were very much part of their nation. Um, yeah, and, cool. yeah, especially in the larger cities like Warsaw or uh, Krakow, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, what do people think? I know we have we have uh, uh, a good number of participants here, forty-six participants. So, so um, <laughs> I what others think. But nobody should feel the pressure, of course. <laughs> You're very welcome to just take in and enjoy the reading and think about some of these things as you feel. I know, Gunda, you have prepared another text that you kind of felt might be useful for us to hear. Yeah, if, if there are no questions at all, um, sure, I can, I can do that. I mean, it's not really a text, it's just an addition to, um, um, to what I, I've been reading just before, and it's it's in addition it's in addition, and so far as um, uh, it only occurred to me when my husband had died that he was so good in dialogue. I mean, he was so he was very close friends with the cardinal here, with the bishop, and he was what well, some of his closest friends were very uh, devoted um, Catholics. And he, I will never forget an evening at the synagogue at Oranienburger Straße, which is a huge old synagogue that, that survived um, uh, in 1938. And um, there was a discussion with two Muslims, uh, two scholars from, I, for, I forgot which country. Um, Oh, and it was so heated, and they were so, Leo was there, and they were there, and it was so um, like this, and then the younger people of us, I mean, Leo, as you all know, was much older than me, and the younger people of us were got really tired, and by then, by one o'clock or so at night, they finally got up, and they hugged, and they, it was all good, and um, it was, it was just wonderful, and this, this, um, this talent for for real dialogue, which means to be completely yourself and give yourself to the other with what you think and what you your your con what you're convinced of. And I always was amazed by it, but only afterwards it occurred to me that that was the basis. This authenticity was the basis for his 
um, for his um, for the talent of dialogue. You you have to do that. So it's a few sentences. I read it and then we can then our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so and 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 so I write about in the biography that he attracted especially young people. I mean his students, and so they they were just hanging at his lips. And then I write, I believe that the attraction had to do not only with his capacity for dialogue, which he had already learned as a child, but also with the fact that in a world where people are alienated from themselves and seek help on how to be authentic, or at least to appear to be so, Leo Trapp knew who he was and represented that uncompromisingly. Leo Trapp was a Jew, and he lived and argued as a Jew. For him, it was never about being agreeable, says the daughter of a friend, and although completely unreligious herself added, I would go to rabbi like him immediately if I had a problem. As much as Trepp loved Lessing and his play Nathan the Wise, he criticized the fact that the play had created the impression among many Jews that Judaism does not necessarily have to be the right religion for them personally either. Of course, he wrote in 1944 in an essay on the topic, all religions should be accepted as the rabbis of the early Middle Ages stated and as Lessing didactic play made clear, and he writes one of the most beautiful parables of literature, which preaches, quote, tolerance, equality, and mutual understanding, quote, and demonstrating, quote, no religion, that no religion should have the right to impose its own brand on a group or despise those who honor God in a different way, end of quote. But he added, the fallacy in Lessing's parable, however, becomes clear when we compare it with the Jewish principle that the rabbis once formulated. The rabbis said, Tzadiki umot haulam yesh lahem helech leolam haba. The righteous of all nations and religions will find salvation. Thus, it is unmistakably clear that salvation does not depend on the validity of a specific religion but on the implicit faith of the believer, whichever religion is, it is. Psychologically, there can and must be only one true religion for the believer, his religion. Lessing's ring parable thus becomes religious suicide because it's if even the believers themselves question whether their religion is the right one, then religion itself becomes irrelevant and useless, quote Leo Trepp, end of quote Leo Trepp, and end of this reading. So before we sign off, there is there a couple of questions that I want you to address. One is, is there an English edition of the book from which you read? Or if there isn't, will there be? We, we hope so, a lot. Um, and um, it has been translated with the help of two good friends who paid for it. And um, now we are looking for a publisher. It's hard because if you don't have real good connections, it's very hard to find a publisher. If, your, if my, my German publisher doesn't do it, it's too expensive for them. So it's, and, and now we try with the help of my rabbi, we, we try to find a publisher. And I really hope because I think it would be very interesting to American Jews as well. I mean, um, Leo's name is still well known, especially among rabbis and among people who, who, who read his books also, of course. So um, yeah, I hope, no, it has been translated, but um, has not been published yet. Okay, we'll, we'll look into it. And if anyone here of this illustrious crowd has an idea, please let exactly. me know. Exactly, if there's a publisher among you, <laughs> just call me. Very good. And then there was the question, what, what do you take as the lessons for today from, from his reminiscences, from his wrestling with Hirsch's vision of, 
of how to negotiate Jewish identity and national identity. What, what do you make of that for today? I really think it's, it's still important to stand up for yourself and as a Jew, but of course uh, you, you, you have to have to have to accept and have to uh, to do the best you can and i think that it's so deeply jewish to do the best you can to make your own country a better place to help to make it a better place and um, that is what i uh, what i see in san francisco what i see whenever i'm there in boston i mean when you see uh, when you think of joseph pollock alone who really does does both i mean he's just such a mensch and and is engaged in so many things. And I see it here in Berlin where, um, I mean, there has been written a lot about the Jews who are afraid of the immigrants because they do bring anti-Semitism, which is true. A lot of them do, and it's a real problem. But still, the Jews were among the first people who stretched out their hands, opened the doors and said, we are here to help, and they went to the Unterkünfte, to the shelters, and they did help. And um, there were funny, funny situation that one guy then, when he saw the Morgan David of a friend of mine said, no, ah, I, I can take anything from you, <laughs> you <laughs> you're a Jew. So that happened, but um, yeah, but, but uh, German Jews as well, um, especially the young generation, really tries to, to have an input on society, which I think is tremendously important. Yeah, if, I th thank you for, for pointing that out, because uh, I, I don't think we know enough about contemporary Jewish life in Germany, and there is a lot of it, and more than people think. And yeah. maybe we should have more opportunity to talk about this and get a sense of what's going on in Germany today. Yeah. So I think with that, I'm going to unmute, unmute everyone so everyone can say goodbye. And I thank you, Gunda, for joining us from Berlin. That was very exciting. <laughs>